Thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm Josh Bongard. I'm a faculty member at the University of Vermont and also part of the uh, Vermont Complex System Center. And I thought what I would do uh, this morning, um, between now and lunch, is to give you a view of um, complex systems through the lens of robotics and AI. I realize I'm standing between us and lunch, so uh, as a roboticist, I promise to make it up uh, to you with some cool videos, which as a roboticist I have to do anyways, but uh, bear with me here. Okay, so um, what I hope you take away from uh, my talk this morning is that one can view robots themselves as complex systems. Uh, the algorithms that we use to design and train those robots, those algorithms themselves are complex systems. And as uh, Iyad and, and Sandy Pentland made clear this morning, as we start to deploy more and more sophisticated and intelligent machines into our world, our world becomes a more interesting um, and possibly dangerous complex system uh, as well. So complex systems, I think, is useful thinking about robots, the algorithms we use to design them, and the social and physical impact of these intelligent machines. And that's, I'm going to try and touch on that today. Okay, um, throughout this talk, I'm going to think about complex systems from the point of view of uh, John Holland. Uh, way back in the 1970s, John Holland wrote uh, a number of, of influential works. And in this one, he described or he underlined the interesting relationship between adaptation and complexity. Um, our world is complex and ever-changing, and as an agent, regardless of whether you're a biological or a machine, um, you have to be complex in some way to be able to continuously deal with the complexity that the world throws at you. So as a roboticist, we're always looking at complexity and how it relates to adaptation. Okay, so again, before I get to the robots, I just want to take a step back and think about sort of the history of robotics and AI, um, where it's uh, come from and where it's going to. A lot of uh, questions about that this morning. Lots of different ways to think about the history of AI. One way I like to think about it is you can sort of discern these three phases in our investigations into intelligent machines. In phase one, um, which started basically at the end of the Second World War with the advent of AI and robotics at that time, we've been trying to create machines that do one thing and do one thing well um, over time. So uh, we didn't have a lot of success with that for many decades, but as we all know very recently with the deep learning revolution and the big data revolution, we've now got uh, surprisingly good at creating machines that do as well as or better than humans, and we've seen a number of examples of that already this morning. So I'm visualizing this here with this geometric metaphor, and I'm going to build up this geometric metaphor as I go. Um, we have a vector here, and you think about any point along this vector as a given machine, and it's obviously its horizontal position on this line is how good it is at its given uh, task. Now that we have machines that are as good or better than humans at several tasks, there was actually just a question about that. Where do we go from here? Um, so I think we're sort of coming to the end of phase one of our study uh, of intelligent machines, and there are a number of other directions we can go in. Um, one of them, which I view sort of as phase two, is creating not just good machines or accurate or performant machines, but general machines, machines that can do multiple things well. Um, this is still an open problem um, in machine learning. This is often known as, um, or the problem is known as catastrophic forgetting. It's very, very difficult to teach a machine to do two or more things, teach a machine to do one task, and as you gradually expose it to a second task, it will start to learn the second task, but unfortunately, it will do so at the same rate that it forgets how to do the first task, catastrophic forgetting. So even the state-of-the-art uh, algorithms that are out there, um, typically they still do one thing and do one thing well. So AlphaGo plays a pretty good game of Go. It does not play a game of chess at all, let alone well or poor poorly. So what we're really looking for now in this two-dimensional space is, again, a point, a single machine that's good at multiple tasks. This is an open problem in uh, AI and robotics as well. That's phase two. Phase three is looking at what's known as embodiment. And again, this is an idea that's been in robotics and psychology for a long time, but remains one of the sort of open problems. Lots of people define embodiment in different ways, but today, just for our purposes, I want you to think about embodiment as a machine that has more and more abilities to push against the world and observe how the world 
uh, pushes back. And as we heard about this morning, embodied machines pose particular opportunities and particular dangers because they're going to live physically alongside us here uh, in the real world. We can imagine this as a continuum, um, this third dimension here where machines are more and more embodied if they are more and more mechanically complex. They have more and more sensors and more and more motors. They have more and more ways in which to push against the world and observe how the world uh, pushes back. So again, we now have a point, uh, points that exist in a three-dimensional space. Any point in this space um, does more or less well at something. Uh, the height of the point represents how many things that machine is trying to do, and its position towards the front or back face of this cube indicates how more or less embodied that machine is. Okay, here's, uh, here's an example of a very recent state of the art uh, in robotics. This is some recent work by Google AI. Uh, they, had, they took seven physical robot arms, as you see here, um, and over the course of four months, these four arms performed 580,000 attempts to grasp objects in the trays placed uh, in front of them. And using all of that data coming from these seven arms over those four months, uh, they were able to train a 1.2 million parameter neural network. And that resulting neural network at the end of the four months um, allowed these seven robot arms to successfully grasp unknown objects 96% of the time. Credible work, state of the art. Where does this ex exist in sort of the space of uh, machines I was just telling you about? Well, if you think about machines as points in this space, you can think about trajectories through this space as a learning algorithm, a training algorithm that is pushing points or pushing machines uh, through this space. So this particular experiment started with more or less random machines that got 50% right. So we started with a point that was to the left of the cube. We have a fixed level of embodiment. So these robot arms, they didn't add, uh, Google AI researchers didn't add sensors and motors to these machines over the course of these four months. So they had a fixed morphology, which means they are trapped in a horizontal plane here, and they gradually are moving from left to right as they get better and better at grasping objects. And they remain at a constant height in this space. We're teaching these robots to grasp objects. We didn't partway through this ask them to do something else uh, in addition. Okay, this is the standard paradigm uh, in robotics. We've also done work here, just as another example here. Uh, this is some older work uh, from, from my group where we have a different robot with a different level of embodiment. It's trying to perform a different task, in this case, legged locomotion, and we used a different kind of training algorithm uh, that enabled this robot to teach itself how to, how to walk. So this is sort of the standard paradigm in robotics research. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, ultimately, we want to try and reach something like artificial general intelligence. Somebody mentioned super intelligence this morning. We don't want to always move in a horizontal line because in that case, we just have a single machine with a single body that is doing one thing better and better. We want to try and figure out how to create machines that get better and better at more and more things until eventually we might have a machine in the, top, uh, in the top right here that's able to hold an intelligent conversation with us and pass the Turing test. Regardless of whether you believe in Turing tests or AGI, generally speaking, we want to move up and to the right. As a roboticist, or most roboticists either explicitly or implicitly are actually trying to push along the grand diagonal in this space uh, of machines. We want to try and create machines that are better and better at more and more things. But in order to get better at more and more things, or things that matter to people, like autonomous driving, for example, you need to have a body. You need to exist physically in the world? Do we start with an autonomous car and try and put autonomy on top of that? Or do we start with a mechanically much more simpler machine, work out all the bugs, and then move our way up to one ton of steel and plastic and metal and so on? So that's the idea. And again, um, roboticists, myself included, believe if we want to try and create truly intelligent machines, they're going to have to be embodied. They're going to have to have physical experiences with the world. One of the things that distinguishes embodied systems from non-embodied systems, like a deep neural network that's 
trapped in a computer, is a robot can go out and literally collect its own experiences. This is something that a deep neural network that's non-embodied cannot do. It has to wait to receive data from someone or something else. And our previous speaker just showed one of the, the problems with that or one of the challenges that arises from being non-embodied. Uh, OK. So different paths we can move through this space, different algorithms we can propose to trace different trajectories through the space of machines. What's the right trajectory? We have no idea, but we do know what the wrong trajectory is. And this is a, a bad habit uh, in robotics, which is to sort of move towards the back face of the cube, to build a very, very complex humanoid robot like the Atlas uh, humanoid robot that you see here. We make a big jump in this space, and when we do, and we task this robot with performing lots of tasks, so we're also moving up rapidly in this cube, we usually get ourselves in trouble and we end up with machines that are trapped in the left-hand face of the cube. They are really no better than, than random. I show this video a lot. This is not to denigrate my colleagues um, who entered the uh, DARPA Robotics Challenge. Um, this is obviously the blooper reel. Um, probably many of you have already seen this. There were a lot of successes that also came out of the, the DARPA uh, Robotics Challenge. But this shows one of the dangers of moving too quickly through the space. This is my favorite one. This robot gets a little bit nervous of all the attention and OK. Again, some great work that came out of this, this uh, very ambitious project uh, hosted by, by DARPA. If we make big jumps through the space, we often get ourselves in trouble. So how do we make small movements through this space? Again, just the visualization. We're trying to find a way towards performant and general machines. OK, so instead of making big jumps, how do we make small jumps? And it turns out the more you think about this, the more difficult this is to do. And if you're a student of the history of mathematics, it uh, kind of reminds you of the history in, in math just before the invention of the calculus. We re realized that we needed to be able to describe well how things change over very small uh, spaces and time. Can we do the same thing with robotics and AI? How do we make a small change to possibly an already complex machine and not disrupt movement along the other two axes? Turns out that moving small distances from the left to the right, making the robot a little bit better at a given task, we're now pretty good at thanks to deep learning. So if we supply an input image at the input layer of a neural network at the top, propagate the signals through, and it gives us the wrong answer, it's taken us 30 or 40 years to figure out how to very carefully tune the synaptic weights in this neural network so that it goes from the wrong answer to the right answer. And we can often do that, which is surprising, um, without disrupting the, this machine's ability to correctly classify dogs in pictures as actual dogs and, and so on. So we can, again, make small changes without disrupting the overall performance of, in this case, a non-embodied deep learner. But it's taken us a long time to figure out how to do that. OK. What about making small jumps along the other axes? If we try and move up, as I mentioned, we gradually expose the machine to a new task. We try to add something to its repertoire. I've colored this vector red because this is an extremely difficult thing for us to do. We don't have a good answer to catastrophic forgetting yet. Um, in just the few years, there's been an explosion of papers uh, published about the catastrophic forgetting problem. So it's, it looks like sort of it's the next big thing, or people are, are at least becoming increasingly interested in it. Um, most of the solutions that are out there propose a modular neural network, um, which is, I think, a nice uh, connection point with um, complex systems, thinking about modular networks. So uh, in Catastrophic forgetting solutions, we propose this module, modular network where subnetworks specialize to hallmarks or signatures of these different tasks. So in this case, there's a little bit of pre-processing at the top that's non-modular, and then subnetwork one deals with task one, and subnetwork two deals with task two. It's a nice approach, but it has some limitations because it's kind of cheating a little bit. We want a general machine, and if it's basically creating a whole bunch of specialists, how well is it going to generalize to unseen instances of task one or task two, or new tasks that are some combination of task one and two? Again, this is sort of an open and interesting problem in robotics 
uh, and AI. I'm going to talk now about the third axis, which is moving from the front of the cube towards the back. We want to make a small change to the body of our robot. We want to give it a new sensor, or a new motor, or some new ability to influence the world without disrupting its current abilities. This is an exceedingly difficult thing to do. As I showed you, the standard paradigm in robotics is usually to move horizontally, but not to move forward and back. It's very rare to see a robotics experiment where the robots themselves are changing over uh, the training regimen. Okay, why is this so hard to do? Well, here's the reason why, is that in robotics, we're often dealing still with neural networks, but they are embedded within a larger network, which is the robot's body itself. So my cartoon robot arm, which you can't see at the bottom here, I apologize. So let me just sketch a, a picture of your mind here. Uh, we have a robot with a shoulder, an elbow, and a wrist, and it's got a gripper where it's grabbing this red ball. These four dots that you see here represent touch sensors that are on the inside uh, of the gripper. And we have three output neurons here, and they're sending signals to the robot's shoulder, elbow, and wrist. So in a, in a robot that's controlled by a neural network, it's sending signals to the motors. The robot's arm moves, and the moment that it moves, the moment that it moves, the sensor values change, and those sensor values return to the input layer of the neural network, and now we have this closed system, and we're dealing not just with a network, but a dynamic network. It's changing, uh, changing over time. Okay, so why is this difficult? Again, you're not going to be able to see this, unfortunately, so I'll have to talk you through this. We might want to make a slight change to the robot arm here by adding an additional degree of freedom to make it a little bit more easy for the robot arm to move around. If we do, we might add an additional output neuron, which is sending a new signal to this new motor. We made a slight morphological change to this robot. So we made a slight change. But unfortunately, by making this slight change, we change the way that the robot moves. And in practice, this means that it completely changes the sensory repercussion the robot experiences from that action. The same output layer, more or less the same output layer, but now we get a completely different result, which I'm showing in red here. So now, suddenly, all the sensors are reporting something different, given the same action. And that propagates all the way through the network. So this is where we stand with robotics. If we're trying to train or design robots that become more complex, we can't do it in a localized manner like we now know how to do with deep learning. It's an open problem uh, in the field. OK, how do we deal with this? Well, we need to understand the relationships between body, brain, and environment. I'm going to spend the rest of my time just briefly touching on a few projects where we try and study this. Um, this one is by uh, my PhD student, Anton Bernatsky, who's here somewhere. There he is in the back. Um, this is a theoretical result, so bear with me here. Imagine we have a robot that's made up of a series of vertically stacked plates. These plates can rotate horizontally. One of the interesting things about studying this kind of machine is that actions can either have local repercussions or global repercussions. What do I mean by that? Imagine the topmost plate turns. It's only influencing itself. A plate that turns at the bottom turns all the plates above it as well. So it has a global repercussion of its action. Again, this is a theoretical construct, but this is generally true with machines and organisms. You can make a movement which has global repercussions from your point of view or global repercussions. How do we design a controller for this robot? Well, we could, for example, place sensors in the base of this robot. The uh, green dots here represent sensors, and we have three motors here aligned along the spine of the robot. So for this simple experiment here, we're going to assume that different morphologies or different bodies mean that we're going to string sensors at different places across the robot's body. Turns out that if we place the sensors in the base of the robot, there is no modular neural network that will work for this robot. We can train uh, neural networks against this robot all we want, and there is no modular neural network. 
There are good neural networks, but they're not modular, which makes things problematic for search, and I won't go into it. Alternatively, we can imagine a different morphology, a different makeup for this robot where we string the sensors along the spine of the robot. And now, by changing the body, which in this case is just sensor distribution, we've made things much, much easier for the search algorithm, which is trying to find a good controller for this robot, and it finds a good and modular neural network might seem in retrospect a little bit obvious, but the point I'm trying to make here is that by choosing a fixed morphology, trapping ourselves in that horizontal uh, plane in the 3D cube I showed you before, we often make things more or less difficult for ourselves. And I would argue that in robotics and AI, we often don't realize we've done that. By studying autonomous cars, by actually starting with actual cars and trying to move towards full autonomy, that might not be the best way to realize uh, efficient and safe autonomous driving. There may be different approaches to that, that problem. OK, um, next one I want to show you. This is some work by another one of my students, Colin Capel, and our colleagues at Vassar College. This, again, has to do with modularity. As I showed you, we can already we can use existing community detection algorithms or the Q metric to measure modularity within a neural network. But once we connect this to a robot, which, again, is invisible for us, unfortunately, we have our robot down here, and we close the loop. The Q metric and other community detection algorithms for modularity are no longer sufficient because they don't span this feedback loop through the robot's body and the environment. So Colin and, and Anton and, and our colleagues came up with this idea of morphological modularity, which goes beyond the Q metric. In morphological modularity, uh, we have a morphologically modular robot if it can actuate one of its motors. In this case, it's rotating its wrist, which is over here and it's not actuating its elbow and its shoulder, so a subset of its motors. And if it has the right body, it has a local sensory repercussion. So that's like me standing here and just moving my hand. I don't really affect the rest of my body. I can feel the sensory repercussions of my action here, but it's all localized. As I'm walking, I'm not morphologically modular. I'm feeling changes on the pressure of the soles of my feet, but also my visual field, everything else is changing. So now we are armed with a metric that takes into account not just networks, but the whole system, the brain body environment system. So we sort of changed our approach to studying modularity by thinking about it through an embodied lens. OK. All right, the last uh, project I want to talk about here is uh, some work in what's now known as the field of soft uh, robotics. Soft robotics is white hot in uh, uh, funding and research at the moment. This is a admittedly biased sample of some of the soft robots that are out there. Some of them are somewhat low tech, some of them are high tech. One of the things that's interesting about uh, research in soft robotics is they're typically made out of uh, exotic materials. Um, the one that you see in the middle there, these are uh, metal foams. They're developed by Rob Shepard's group uh, at Cornell. They're very interesting properties, but they're also very hard to characterize. Um, so we've now moved into this domain of robotics where our traditional tools of analyzing and training those machines breaks down. There's no way to apply inverse and forward kinematics to a metal foam, or at least not in a way that anyone, anyone understands yet. So this is a very difficult design space. It's non-intuitive for a human engineer to sit down with a uh, blob of metal foam and design a robot that does something well and does something safe. So how do we design these machines? So we're moving now away from traditional optimization into design, where we're going to subjugate not just the, the neural network, but the body of the robot as well to optimization. The best tool we have out there is evo evolutionary algorithms. Um, evolutionary algorithms have been around for a long time. Um, for quite a while, they didn't have a very good reputation. They didn't have good proofs of convergence. But they're coming back now with a vengeance because they often can do things that are beyond traditional learning uh, paradigms. How do you learn the shape of a body or the topology of a, of a robot? Difficult thing to do. Like biological evolution, artificial evolution can sculpt both 
the neural network controller, the brain of the robot along with the body. Here's a recent example of this um, from uh, Nick Cheney, a former student, and uh, my colleague, Hod Lipson. What you're watching in this video is a snapshot of an evolutionary algorithm uh, at work. An evolutionary algorithm at all times maintains a population of machines. What you're watching here is the, uh, the best robot in the population at any given time. We have a fitness function that measures the fitness or the quality of these machines. In this case, fitness is just uh, forward travel, as you can imagine. And if you look at the fitness curve in the bottom, you can see that over evolutionary time, we're gradually evolving um, bodies and brains of robots that do better and better. Um, these are obviously endlessly fascinating um, and entertaining. You'll notice that these robots are made up of 3D pixels or voxels. Um, so this simulation is built on top of VoxCAD. It's an open source system. You can download it and, and evolve your own uh, galloping robots here. I'll start this robot, I'll start this video over, explain a little bit more about what's going on. We have an evolutionary algorithm that is clearly um, defining the geometry of these robots. All these robots have different 3D geometry. And you're no you'll notice that the voxels are also painted with different colors, where the color represents material property. So in this case, red and green, you can think of these as muscle cells. So they oscillate in response to a central pattern generator that's outputting just a regular uh, signal. Red and green expand and contract in antiphase. If your task is to move as quickly as possible and energy is not a consideration, then surprise, surprise, you become basically a ball of muscle. If you squint carefully, from time to time, you'll see a light, gray, uh, light blue voxel, which is a soft, passive material. This is the robot equivalent of fat. And you'll also see from time to time dark blue voxels, which are passive, rigid material, the robot equivalent of bone. But in this case, evolution has sort of thrown fat and bone out and said, all I need is muscle in this case. OK. So this is some work, again, as you can see from a few years ago. Um, I don't have time to go into the details of how exactly this evolutionary algorithm works. I'm happy to talk to people about this over the lunch break. But basically speaking, these robots are designed by a network, which you see on the left. This is not a neural network anymore. It's not controlling the robot. This network is building the robot. It's a design tool, or actually a generative tool. It has some properties in common with, with GANs. How does it work? We take this empty cage that you see on the right, and we visit a number of points inside this cage. We take the coordinates of, of the position of each point. We feed those coordinates into the input layer of this network, propagate those coordinates down. And as they propagate down through this network, they are transformed in various ways. You'll see these little inset functions inside the nodes. These are activation functions for those of you that are familiar with neural networks. So in essence, what this network on the left is doing is composing a bunch of coordinate transforms. And by doing that, at the output layer, uh, we have two output neurons in this case. The presence output neuron will either place a voxel at the current position or not. And the material output neuron will paint a voxel if it's placed at that position with one of these four material properties. The nice thing about these networks, which are known as CPPNs, or Compositional Pattern Producing Networks, is they produce patterns. And they're clearly networks. And they do so by painting regular patterns across space. They're composing coordinate transforms. So within a given uh, volume, in this case, we get regular geometries and regular distributions of material properties. The ugly secret of this approach and others like it is the evolutionary process works well for a few hundred generations and then runs out of gas. Um, so this training algorithm works a little bit, but has some problems as well. This idea of uh, optimizing body and brain together have been around since the mid-90s. So we've been working on this problem for about 20 years. And generally, this is what our uh, performance curves look like. Why is it so much more difficult to optimize bodies uh, than brains? I showed you one of the reasons why. is because you make a small change to the body, and you usually disrupt everything. 
Um, in more recent work, uh, Nick and myself and some of our colleagues came up with this idea to allow evolution to make changes to the body without disrupting performance. And it works by protecting morphological innovations. So I'm going to end with this concept today. Imagine we have this cartoon robot, which luckily you can see. Um, it's a biped robot. It's got two legs, and it has a neural network controller embedded inside of it. And let's imagine this is partway through the training algorithm, so it's moving at medium speed, which the arrow represents here. Imagine this robot produces a child robot, and the child robot has longer legs than the parent. As you would imagine, if the child has longer legs but the same controller, that controller is probably not going to be able to coordinate movement of these longer legs. The child robot falls over, gets less fitness, fitness than the parent, and is swept out of the population by evolution. And we've lost something that might potentially be useful. In this new evolutionary algorithm, we protect morphological innovations by reducing selection pressure. So if you experience a change in your body, you have a greater chance of producing offspring, even if you're not so fast. In some cases, the grandchild, which now has long legs like its parent, the grandchild uh, accumulates a change to its controller, represented by the red arrow here. And so the controller might actually readapt with the right mutations and exploit this potential innovation. And if you have longer legs and you know how to use them right, you can travel faster than your parent and your grandparent that had shorter legs. OK. Um, I don't have time to go too much into the details, but basically what this ends up doing is to take this picture and turns it into this picture, which has been sort of the long-term vision in our field of evolutionary robotics for a long time, which is that if we just keep throwing uh, computational effort at this problem, we get robots that are more and more morphologically sophisticated, their geometries become more complex, their distribution of material properties become more interesting, and they do better at the the task. Okay. Okay, so just to summarize, what I've tried to argue here is that in order to realize true AI, we need to not only improve performance, but also generality. And also embodiment is important. They need to have a body with which to push against the world and observe how the world uh, pushes back. I've shown you that changing morphology while retaining performance is an open problem. We don't have a good answer to this like we now do in neural networks. Maybe we can borrow some of the ideas from deep learning and apply it to this domain of embodied systems. Robots are complex systems. Uh, they're made up of control components, neurons and synapses, which control the movement of the robot. But those control components are embedded within morphological components, arms and legs which are themselves embedded within the overall robot, which is itself embedded within individual lineages, which I didn't have time to go into. Those were the colored lines you saw in the picture. So we have different lineages that are competing with one another inside of a, an overall population. So you have at least four levels of organization where most of these levels can be characterized by networks and analysis of those networks. We go from neural networks all the way up to ecological networks. So I think a lot of the work going on in this community would be of great use uh, for us in uh, robotics. I showed you a few projects. The correct morphology admits modular controllers. Anton can tell you more about that if you're interested. Expanding our understanding of modularity from networks to whole brain, body, and environment uh, systems makes it easier to evolve or train these systems. And finally, protecting morphological innovations improves evolvability. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, our funding sponsors. There's the link uh, to our lab where you can see many more cool robot videos and also a few uh, publications. Thank you very much.